listeners, I'm Robin Black, and this is It's All About Healing podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us. We have Maria. She is the author of On the Rocks, and I'm very excited to speak with her. And she tells us how we can make our worst day or how our worst day could be the path to our success. Maria, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, Robin. Thank you so much for having me on. And I love the theme of this podcast. I'm so excited to talk with you. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into your book. Sure. So a little bit about me. I am an author, but I'm also a nonprofit grant writer. And I work for a nonprofit outside of New York City in Patterson, New Jersey. And it's called the St. Paul's Community Development Corporation. And really the mission of it is to give people not a handout, but a hand up and to help support their basic needs, whether it be food insecurity, shelter, uh, lacks in education gaps, um, medical, really we do everything, AmeriCorps, permanent housing, temporary housing, we do it all. <laughs> Holiday nice. gifts, that's I, half of, I, you're in my studio right now and the other half of this studio is Santa's workshop because I, coordinate a holiday gift program for about 250 kids in Patterson and greater Passaic County here in New oh, Jersey. Nice. nice. I like that. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about your book and how it all started. Sure. So it all started 17 years ago. I had no idea it was even going to be a book. I was just working on a, a family history project with my dad. And, um, you know, he was really going through a rough time. We, we all were. Uh, he had just come out of um, prison, actually, and he had lost his beloved restaurant and really everything that he worked so hard to build. And whenever you have a loss or a trauma like that, it's hard to just kind of pick up the pieces and, and move on. And so I knew that his best days and his best times were at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I started to ask him stories like, dad, tell me about a time where a celebrity came into the restaurant or tell me about a time that something really unexpected happened or tell me about the first fight in the bar. And, you know, the stories being a writer myself, I could see these stories coming to life and having a lot of commercial value more than just family history. But at the time, I didn't really know what to do with it other than, you know, we were recording these conversations on, as my kids say, since I lived back in the dinosaur days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have these little tape deck, mini tape decks that you would take yeah. to um, record professors. And then you could transcribe your, your notes um, <laughs> before cell phones could do all this stuff. And so that's how I initially recorded all these conversations. And then I would transcribe them. And I got to as far as I could get with them without having some help. And I was lucky enough to have a really wonderful AP English teacher mm -hmm. uh, named at the time Ruthie Dines and now Ruthie Robbins. And uh, she and I had really never lost connection. Um, we are, you know, the, the whole six degrees of Kevin Bacon. We're about, I don't know, 100 degrees uh, between the two of us. She is the same exact age as my father. She grew up on a street over from where my father's restaurant once was. She was one of the first initial customers at the restaurant. She was my teacher. I was friends with her sons. There was just so many connections. And even after college, her one son moved to California and so did I. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot going on there. And she had heard that I was working on this project and she had asked to see some of the pieces that I was writing. And she was also working with a writing group in Buffalo, New York. And she said, well, can I take some of this stuff up there and see what, what they think? So I had nothing to lose. I'm like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And she came back and she said, you know, they have two things to say. First of all, this book needs a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I, I already knew. And second of all, it has a lot of commercial potential, which I also kind of felt in my gut. 
And so from then on, for the next seven years, uh, Ruthie and I worked together very diligently on the project as co-authors and co-writers, uh, sending pages back and forth and texting and emailing and calling like incessantly through the pandemic. And we finished the book, the manuscript in the summer of some summer of 2020, which was quite possibly the worst time Mm -hmm. finish a manuscript because everybody had written a book at yeah. that time because what else were we doing right right and um there was so much competition and especially in my genre which is narrative nonfiction, which is nonfiction true stories that read like mm -hmm. they are fiction you needed to have a full complete manuscript and you needed to have basically a book proposal, which is the why or the business plan behind your book. And it's pretty intense. A manuscript on its own is about 80, 90,000 words. And then on top of that, the business plan is about 60 pages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a lot to, to put together. And then you'd have to do query letters, which were basically these introduction letters to agents. And it was, it was really, really tough. And um, we were very unsuccessful <laughs> for a while. Yeah. And what changed that is I started going to virtual conferences and I was able to meet my uh, agent now uh, at one of those virtual conferences. And I was able to, just like I'm talking with you face to face, I was able to talk to her and tell her my vision for the story. And um, that was that about six months later, she signed us, we went on submission in the fall of 2021. And the book finally got picked up by a publisher in um, the fall of 2022. So it was a very long, arduous process, lots yeah. of no's, lots. I'm like the queen of rejection. Everyone tells mm -hmm. me no. <laughs> yeah. but I just keep on trudging, you know, and, and keep on going. And I'm so glad that I did because the book has been so incredibly well received. Um, you know, I just, I can't even believe we were just in Forbes magazine a couple of days ago as one of the six books that you have to pick up for the holidays for the entrepreneurial spirit. I was featured in LA Weekly over the summer as one of the 15 authors to watch for in 2023. Mm -hmm. We've been on, you know, all kinds of podcasts, radio, television, national, international. It's, it's just been so cool. So, you know, never, never, ever, ever give up on your dream. Absolutely. So tell us like, what is the book more about? So the book is actually written from a really interesting perspective. So mm -hmm. it's about my father and it's about his rise to success in the restaurant industry back in the 80s through the early 2000s. And he was a postal worker. And whenever I was four years old and my sister was nine months old, he decided to leave his cushy career and buy a failing business in a really seedy, corrupt part of town because he couldn't afford anything else. Mm -hmm. And so he bought this business in McKee's Rocks, hence on the rocks. McKee's Rocks is also short for the rocks. Uh -huh. And it took about three years of intense struggle. And finally, one uh, Hail Mary review was the start engine to all of the success and fame that followed. And we had celebrities and sports stars and broadcasters and you name it come to our little 83 seat restaurant. And, mm -hmm. you know, this was back before a time as my kids call me the dinosaur, mm -hmm. um, as I had mentioned before, this was back before the time of Google or uh -huh. MapQuest. Um, this was r whenever you were going somewhere, you went to the AAA office and you got a an actual map that you had to read yeah. <laughs> and try to figure out. So it was very rare to have such a gem of a restaurant. It was one of America's top 10 Italian restaurants mm -hmm. uh, back during that time. And all of the others were in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, mm -hmm. San Francisco, Miami. So it was it was very rare to have something like that in McKee's Rocks. And that's, you know, just part of the story. And then 
course, every story has a good hook and a, a good falling point. And the falling point was whenever I was 20 years old in between jobs, um, I received a knock at the door and it was the federal government looking for my father. Mm -hmm. And he had been um, mentioned in a federal grand jury investigation as a person of interest, even though he had no criminal record or background. And it led to a three-year fairly invasive investigation when then he pled guilty to tax evasion charges and went to prison. So wow. it's a very juicy story. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We have a, have a little of everything, you know, if you like a lot of action. It's really short chapters, but I think the unique part of it is that it's written by myself and my co-author, Ruthie mm -hmm. Robbins, who we both are female, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's written in the perspective of a male. So yeah. it's the first person point of view of my father. So if we've done our job well, while you read the book, you feel like you're sitting at the bar rail with him, talking to him about the stories that happened at the restaurant. Wow, that does seem like a pretty interesting book. <laughs> I like that. So this whole journey, it. so how old were you now when, when this started? Whenever he got into the restaurant was uh, February 1986, and I was four years old. My sister was just nine months old. So, <laughs> um, and it, it follows, the story probably follows us me through my 20s mm -hmm. so it it takes place of about 15 plus or minus years um you know where a whole lot happened <laughs> during well, that what, time what were you do doing during this time um, well, whenever I was four years old, I was just kind of hanging out and being a four year old right. and loving, um, you know, <laughs> the fact that I had this big kitchen to play in, you know, mm -hmm. kids nowadays, they have plastic, everything's plastic, right? They have mm -hmm. those plastic kitchens, you know, so much plastic food. It's like, geez, I can't even eat another plastic carrot. Mm -hmm. But for me, my playground was the restaurant. It would go and pretend like I was serving my Barbies drinks or, you know, wait on my teddy bears in the bar stools. And, and it was cool and it was magical. And then, you know, I would say whenever I got to be an older child, there was definitely a little resentment um, because it took away so much time for my dad. My dad was really all in on this business. So we always said it was the son that he never had. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older into high school, into college, I decided to jump on board and I worked side by side with my family and just learned so much, learned so much about people, learned so much about the public about working in service and mm -hmm. hospitality. And these are things that I think really helped shape who I am today and my overall personality. And I went to Syracuse University for undergrad and Pepperdine for my master's degree. But I really do believe that I got the best education in McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, um, working for my dad uh, because of all the the life lessons that were learned. He always said things like, you know, we're not just teaching people about restaurants here. We're teaching you about life and how to live and how to interact with people and how to be a functional member of society. And these are all very powerful lessons for, for young people. Yeah. And then, so that's what I was, I was kind of meaning more. So is, when you said that you were in your 20s and you were working side by side with your father, like, did you guys know what was going on? Did you know what he was doing? Um, no, I mean, everybody was kind of blindsided by it. Um, because it, what happened is somebody else got in trouble completely independently of my dad. And then they were sort of asked to do an offer and compromise and to give a name of somebody that they kind of suspected was doing something wrong. And that's how my dad kind of got pulled into the spider web. Now, my dad was also offered to, I guess, rat out somebody else and he just wouldn't do it. And so for him, loyalty, 
is a really big deal. And that was not a path that he wanted to go down. And because of that, at that time, if your name was mentioned in a federal grand jury investigation, it's no longer a civil case. It's a criminal case. Yeah. And so they will find something on you. You just don't know what they're going to find on you. And so for my dad, he had ran for political office, which I think was one of his tragic mistakes. And he got into some money problems and the government was able to find records that he underreported his taxes. And um, because there was such a high rate of success um, for the prosecution for the you know US federal government, he decided to plead guilty rather than pleading innocent and having a the um, <clears throat> possibility of going to prison for more time. Because at that time, too, which things have changed quite a bit, mm -hmm. the Clinton administration had passed these federal mandated minimum laws. So if you served, if you did this particular crime with this particular severity, that was your sentence, kind of a grid system. Mm -hmm. Since then, that's been found unconstitutional. So if this happened today, he likely would not have gone to prison. But because it happened then he did and you know he did so with grace and with um respect and not pulling anybody else down and not denying anything that you know happened he admitted that it did happen and that he made an honest mistake yeah and then so where's your dad now so now he is, he had a lot of health issues over the last 17 odd years. Um, open heart surgery, back, major back surgery, his kidneys failed. So he's the two time transplant recipient, mm -hmm. um, which is just amazing and, and so beautiful. Um, but he's doing really, really well, knock on wood now. And he's uh, retired and not only just enjoying his grandkids, but he's enjoying the benefits of this book. So for a while, no one was calling him. We kind of disappeared off of the radar, um, mm -hmm. you know, after being the family in town and then, you know, overnight, nothing, we kind of lost everything. But now he has this kind of second coming slash resurrection that's happened. And so mm -hmm. he's going out with friends and, having dinners and going on the media just like I do and having a lot of fun. You know, his former life, in addition to being a restaurateur, he had his own radio show. He had a column in the in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, which is Pittsburgh's top paper. So he's kind of getting back into it. He does a lot of radio interviews. He, you know, is just having a lot of fun and really reliving all of these wonderful memories. And we're just so grateful and so supportive that um, people have, have taken to this story, even that don't know him or have never been to the restaurant because it has this element of humanity mm -hmm. and um, what it means to be authentic and what is important in life and love and resiliency and redemption and how you learn from your mistakes and grow from it. And I think because of that, that's something that everybody, no matter what your path is, whether you're a foodie or not, mm -hmm. you can relate to, you know, and you can grasp onto. I like that. I like that a lot. So what um, advice would I say that do you have for aspiring authors out here? <laughs> Do not give up. Um, I'm going to share with you my stats because they're horrific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it'll make you feel better because I always hear people say, I sent 10 query letters and I didn't get any request. Uh -huh. Well, guess what? Guess how many I sent? 265. Wow. Out of the 265, 140 people never even had the decency to answer me back. They completely ghosted me. Wow. And this was after some of them had requested the entire manuscript, my entire book proposal, a query letter, a cut sheet of all of the media that I, I had ever been in. And that's a lot of work. And um, 
sent all of that nothing. And then over a hundred people just said flat out, thanks, but no thanks. And, mm -hmm. you know, some even laughed at me. One guy yelled at me. I was like, what, what is going on? I paid yeah. him. I paid to pitch him at a conference mm -hmm. and he stopped me one line through and he said, is this a joke? <laughs> I'm like, no, this is certainly what? not a joke. And so, and, you know, out of the 17 people that did want to see more information, only one person ended up offering me representation. And the book took almost 11 months, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe 13 months, whenever my contract was through in order to be picked up mm -hmm. anything over six months. And now I, I think the time frame is maybe a little, a little larger because they're it just is so much competition, but yeah. it it was any, any time a book was with a publisher for over six months, it's kind of the kiss of death. So yeah. <laughs> I share this with all of you because you have to believe in you more than anybody else does. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that you cannot be humble and take constructive criticism. You certainly should. It took me 17 years to write this book because we were constantly editing and re-editing and thinking, oh, should we put this part in or maybe not? And refining, that's not what I mean. I don't mean mm -hmm. write a book overnight and just expect it to sell a gazillion right. copies. You right. know, try your best, put your best effort forward. But once you do that and once you know it's the best that you can do, don't give other people the power to tell you no, or if they do just realize that they're not the right partner for you. And mm -hmm. there is somebody else out there. And even, even if you go and you self publish, there's no shame in that game. Mm -hmm. There there's many, many books that are very high quality that are self published now. And, you know, you're the one that's in the driver's seat of that success. And yeah. whether you're self-published or published more traditionally, you're still going to have to do all of your own marketing. So regardless of that, you are the person that's going to be the determinant of what's going to compel people to want to pick up your story. So right. Don't give up. Keep on trying. Don't be discouraged. So many people will discourage you and don't honestly don't. And, you know, have have thick skin and no one to walk away and don't get beat up too much. So it's a, it's a hard world out there really is. <laughs> don't read the Amazon reviews unless they're good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. And how can all the listeners um, get a hold of you or how can they read you? Sure. So um, my website is mariacpalmer.com. Um, I do have on the bottom of that page, I have a newsletter that you can certainly sign up for. And, you know, that gives very occasional updates. I, I only send something out if I have something to say. So, you know, <laughs> you don't get spammed by me or anything like that. Um, we have several events that are coming up. We have a really cool virtual event that'll be um, next week on December 14th that people can kind of tap into. I'm going to be reading some of the book and then doing a public q and A. I I have lots of cook and book events. So mm -hmm. I hands-on cooking classes and then we sit down over dinner and have a book discussion and a q and A and then a book signing. There's just lots of lots of wonderful stuff going on on social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Joe Costanzo. That's J O E C O S T A N Z O. Prima Donna. P R I M A D O N N A. And you know, there's many other ways to kind of keep in touch with uh, what what's happening. That's all on my website for sure. Okay. And then I'll also put that in the show notes as well. So if that's all that you have, then that we are good to go. Did you have anything else to add? No, I think that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Robin. This has been fun. No it's been really fun. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. And again, of course. I'm Robin Black. This is It's All About Healing Podcast. Everyone stay blessed.